family members of, for me at any rate, the finest comedy act that there's been in the north of England uh, for many, many, I'm not allowed to say how many years, but for many, many years. I was told to say they are the greatest comedy act in the country. Crap in the town, but brilliant in the country. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome Mr. Graham Walker and Mr. Robin Colville, collectively known as the Fabulous Grumbleweeds! Do. You, you notice you've got the expensive chairs. And look what I've got. <laughs> Both you and Graham, you do it. You've got a fantastic number of voices. I'm up to four now. <laughs> <laughs> I like the one, the, the, the Victor Meldrew. I love the Victor Meldrew. I believe I don't believe it. That one. Yes. I don't do it. You don't do it. <laughs> Doing. Just before we before we can give us another one that you don't do. The another one I do. Well, the, most of the people I do now, I'm gonna have to start. I'm gonna have to get my finger out and learn some new ones because most of the people I do impressions of, I do about 120. Most of them are dead. <laughs> so people actually come up to us in the business and say, "You're not thinking of doing an impression of me?" I said, "No, good, because everybody you do dies. <laughs> don't do it." <laughs> So, and, and it's true, we do a lot, don't we? And they've all died on me. Like, I did Wurzel Gummidge and met um, the guy that did Wurzel Gummidge. Um, Pertwee. John Pertwee. And he died. <laughs> Hello there, Mr. Crowe, And I was talking about, Hello, I'm Sally. And then he died. So, <laughs> you don't want any, me to do an impression of you. Trust me. <laughs> let's, let's... But I, I, you know, I actually got fired from four jobs doing impressions. Well, when I was, no, it's true. I was, when I was, a, I was an electrician, and uh, I got fired for doing impressions of the boss and got caught doing it. And my very first impression was um, of a television show and it was called the Tinger and Tucker Club. Anybody remember it? 1950 something it was. It was black and white telly and they had these little bears and these little bears. Wow. And it was her voice speeded up on tape. Do you remember that? Yeah. And she speeded her voice because they didn't want it to sound too fast. So they didn't sound like... Blah, 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 blah. She spoke very slowly, and then they speeded the tape up, so it was the right speed, but it had this weird vibrato, and that was my very first impression. It sounded something like this. And I got 500 lines for doing that in class. I must not go over the wibbly wobbly way with Auntie Jean. Did you do well, out of school, Robin, or were you, were no, you, I hate it. you were always in trouble? Yeah, I wasn't in trouble. I wasn't a troublemaker. I, I, I was like Graham in many respects. It was the big lads used to say, you know, make me laugh or so let you. <laughs> so, class I clown. Them, made them laugh, you know, yeah. class clown. And learned to run and learned to tell jokes and that's how I survived. Yeah. Survived the bullies. Yeah. Uh, but classes, I didn't, I didn't really like it. I didn't know anything. I mean, I was the bloke who used to get the board rubber bounced off me head and 500 lines because, you know, where's Adrian's rock? Round his house, miss! You know, that sort of stuff. I used to do that for real. Was it at the school then when you actually met? After? After the school? Yeah, I just left school. I was working my dad's butcher shop. And uh, that, that's another hive of information. That um, we, uh, My mother, she's only four foot, not my mother, bless her, four foot six, I think she was. And she used to make everybody laugh. She used to make the customers repeat themselves if they said anything wrong. Um, yes, she did. <laughs> Who is lying prostitute on the ground? Uh, yeah. The, kids used to kids used to come in the shop and uh, to, can you can I have four lamb chops, please? And will you make them lean? <laughs> so she used to put them on scale like that. <laughs> and, uh, one Christmas Eve, we're working in shop one Christmas Eve and uh, the fellow that sold us our turkeys had got pleurisy. So we had to go and dress our own turkeys and, and pluck them in this farmyard and then go and open the shop and, and then work all day and then go back and pluck turkeys and by the time we came to Christmas Eve we were all tired out. And there's a knock on the, on the door, it was quarter to nine, Christmas Eve. I remember. Woman, there she said, are you still open? 
We don't say, what's up, love? She says, well, I've been Christmas shopping in Leeds and I've forgotten to buy a turkey. You have one? My dad says, yes, we, we do. And we did, we had one. He went in the fridge, got the turkey out, put it on the scale. He said, that's a nice one. That's uh, £4.16 and a penny. Three decimal. <laughs> oh, that's very nice. Have you got a little, one a little larger? He says, I'll see what I can do, love. And I thought, how's he going to do this? <laughs> Took the turkey off the scale, went into the fridge, and as he'd taken the turkey off the scale, it palmed a two pound weight. <laughs> went into the fridge and pushed the two pound weight <laughs> up the turkey's backside. He came out and he said, now, now this is a bit heavier. He says, oh, that's a five pound, 16 and six. She said, I'll have them both. I thought, how's he going to get away with this? He said, well, one of them's mine. She said, well, you can have the large one. <laughs> I used to pick him up on the night and we oh. sat there and said, hey, we're sitting in the van there, are you coming? And we sat scrubbing the block. Oh, oh his mother was standing there, he's not coming yet. No, oh, scrub the block. She was just like, what? what's the name? Oh, you can see everything wrong. Hilda Beck. She was just like Hilda Beck, his mother. She was a lovely woman. I loved her to be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he'd started work, and that's when you met him after school. So how did he meet? Well, he was the, uh, the projectionist at the Capital Cinema in Leeds. Mm. He had winkle pickers, a bubble car, and he had his hair dyed tartan. <laughs> Don't ask me why. <laughs> and that was it. And then he, they used to, him and Morris, when Morris was down there, they used to go to the cinema, they didn't know me, and I was the projectionist with his white wing up, his red bubble car, my hair out here, and looking a complete idiot. But I thought I was fantastic. And they used to say, seeing him, I'm going to batter him one of these days. <laughs> one of these days. And then the next day, I said, <laughs> I met them in a coffee bar, I said, do you want to join the group? Well, who's in it? I said, up to now you. And that was that. <laughs> so, 69, 62, that was. Any planning to that, or did you, why did you pick on them? Which is coincidence, Morris would play his guitar I see. in, in the, the coffee bar yeah. when he came in to fix the jukebox. To fix the jukebox. Because they so, found out you were an electrician, so they said, Can you fix the jukebox? And Morris would play his guitar because there was no music. And we also drink coffee and ride motorbikes. Mm. Um, we were alright, there were no graffiti and uh, you know, there were no bad feelings. It was just a, a nicer time. And we, we, he said, You want to join this group? And off it went. So, what do, what do you do? Did you have a format for this? Group when he first started, you, no, you mentioned the guitar. It no, it wasn't. We, we couldn't play. We were rubbish. Awful. We were awful. Absolutely awful. Yeah. I, I, I bought a kit of drums. I know a lot about electricity, but I didn't know anything about drums. I must get hasten to add. When I was a child, you know, you said it about school and bullies and stuff like that. I had this great way. They used to come round to my house to well, let's go get girl will, right? I electrified the house. <laughs> You would all love to do that today. I'd love to do it today, but actually electrified those wires running across the gates, around the windows, inside the door, and all I would do is turn a switch, and there was 240 volts running on everything outside. And these kids were coming in, going, ah, 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 and that was it, I got them. The trouble was I forgot to turn it off, and I got the postman and the window cleaner. And this nice policeman came round to the house, Quickly unplugged all these <laughs> Anyway, um, I digress. We, I bought this set of drums, set of drums, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be a drummer. I've got them all home. There's all these bits of metal and drums. and I didn't know how to put them together. I actually took them back to the shop. They said, can you show me how to set them up? And that was it. They had to show me how to set them up. Took them back home and I just ate anything. So you've got a, guitar, guitar, you've got a guitarist that couldn't really play. He had three chords. Mm -hmm. Three chords. You Him that couldn't play any chords, but he was a nice chap. And, and I, I got a bass guitar. Yeah. And there's only four strings on a bass. That's why we got him bass. And you only hit them one at a time. <laughs> So it's fairly easy for me, you see. So out of all three of us, I was the best one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we went into a competition, and the, the 1963 it was, this competition, it was called the Young Ones Competition, it was the Queen's Hall Leeds, and there was 46 bands on, groups. Now these groups had all been, well, they were big names then, they were massive names. Uh, the Cresters being one of them, of yeah. whom Johnny Casson was the drummer, believe it or not. And uh, they were on the bill, and all these groups, and us, with this set of equipment that was worth about oh, 10 quid. If that. If that. <laughs> In those prices. Yeah. 
And uh, all the rest of these groups had fantastic suits, gold army jackets, they had Ludwig drums and big amplifiers and Fender guitars, they had all the equipment and they were all doing all the shadows walk and all this sort of stuff. And they were all brilliant was, and, and we were on and we only knew two songs, Rockin' Robin and... Um, <laughs> somebody police whistle. <laughs> telephone. <laughs> somebody telephone. And uh, so, uh, and we didn't... We didn't stand a chance. We just didn't stand a chance. And we thought, well, the only way we're going to win here is with originality. So we did stupid things like we put flowers in our glasses and we bowed down on the floor. We put the drum kit the wrong way around, faced the back of the stage. So I was facing, not facing the audience. And we just came on. Everybody just, mouths just dropped and looked at us. <laughs> and they said, they're mental. And, and, did you and do... we got 100 points for originality. <laughs> we got nothing for sound. But we got all these points for originality, and when he added all the points up, we actually came third <laughs> out of 46 groups, and they hated us. And we only knew two songs, and we got like, loads of bookings all over. We said, well, we don't know any more songs. <laughs> so we've got a position whereby you've got a drum kit that can't really play, he's got four string guitar that can only just manage to yep. play, mm. you've got Morris that can do three chords. three chords, but you've got the idea for comedy. It more or less came naturally the comedy, because like Robin, he was a, a born mimic, and I used to make my, the rest of my class laugh. So we used to do, uh, he said, can you do Steptoe and Son? Yeah. Can you do Hilda Baker? Yeah. Can you do uh, Harry Worth? Yeah. So we used to do all those, and, and of course, off we went, working men's clubs. How many years have we done since we've done Steptoe? Um, well, 25. 25 years, well, yes. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, that, that, was, that was one of your most uh, famous yeah. impressions, the, the Steptoe and Son. Yeah. I can't get me breath. Well, that's how so much you won't use it. <laughs> Full of celebrities tonight, my lady, ladies and gentlemen. Great friend of mine. You might have seen him on the TV recently. Would you welcome a great friend of mine, Mr. Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> uh, Alright. The dogs are still crapping all over my house. I walked in the kitchen the other day and I stood in a pile of dog food. I skidded across the floor and I managed to wipe my shoe about five minutes later the plumber come in and he did it. I said, I've just done that. <laughs> so, I'm on a whiskey diet. I lost three days last week. <laughs> Where does the name come from? Oh, I wish we had a really funny answer for that, but mm. we don't. It was, a, he had a sister, well he still has a sister. Mm. His, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> His sister used to make words up instead of swearing. And one day she hit her thumb and said, ah, oh, grumbleweed. And he said, that's it. That yeah, that's it, that's simple, it, yeah. as that. simple yeah. as that. So if she hadn't have hit her thumb, I wouldn't be sat here now. No. <laughs> Mind you, we might have been, she, she might not have said though, we might have been called Bastard Doss. <laughs> I never got any work. <laughs> Do you know I was complimented on my driving today? A little note on the windscreen, it said, parking fine. That was nice, wasn't it? <laughs> so, hello, the front row. He's a big but butch man down here. Now, what's your name? This is Charlie down here. This is Charlie. Because we worked in a gay club two weeks ago. Fancy seeing you twice in a fortnight, Charlie. <laughs> nice to see you again. In, in men's clothes again. I'm staying in a horrible hotel. I've been there three days now. I had to call the manager in. I said, I've been here three days. There's no toilet paper. He said, you've left it till now. Haven't you got a tongue in your head? I said, well, yes, but I've got a neck like a giraffe. <laughs> so you're still in the butcher shop. Yep, you're still doing the, the, the cinematography. I was, yeah, I, no, I was a jukebox engineer then. I was, oh, doing, right. I was fixing fruit machines, doing impressions of the boss and getting fired. And 
yeah. but for Jewish people, like, all right, what do you want to do here? And he, he stood behind me and oh, I've got the sack again, haven't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was me. But we, we were practical jokers. We were famous for our practical jokes. We've calmed down, down a bit now, haven't we? In Scarborough, we used to do some dreadful things to people. Poor old Stu Francis. We made his life a misery on that summer season, we did, didn't we? Yeah, it was, it was a spectacular summer season. It was at the Opera House Theatre, which is now derelict. It was the Opera House um, Theatre. And we had Stu Francis, a guy with Humphrey Bunn, and some girl dancers, and um, Patty Gold. And it was all practical jokes from start to finish. I'll tell you some of them and then Graham will tell you Go some. On, yeah. It was, the whole season was just how who can top each other. <laughs> When you're top of the building, you go on last, and then in a summer show, everybody comes down at the end for the finale. So they don't want to sit and listen in the wings for an hour, listen to our act for an hour, so they all go to the bar, which is outside in the bar, and they've got a little tannoy speaker, which is the act in the background. So they, they know that when we get to a certain number, I think it was Demis Russo in that particular show, when we got to the Demis Russo, and oh, we've got three minutes left, time to go and get changed, and in for the finale, and everybody would come down and get changed, and come down for the walk down and the finale. And uh, Stu Francis was always the last, he finished his pint, he was always the last, he always just got his suit on, just in time to come to do the finale. So one night we nailed his shoes to the floor, <laughs> we stitched up the cuffs of his thing, we, we, we stitched up his trousers and we put tomatoes in his shoes, raw tomatoes in his shoes, so he dived in and couldn't get anything, and it was really funny when he came down for the finale. But the best one with regard to the finale was we recorded the show. We, we had, we had a, a tape of the entire show from one of the nights and then we just slowly faded the sound down, or the sound guy did, when they were all in the bar. And then they put the tape on from the night before and yet it was on 10 minutes. And so they played our last number in the bar. Oh, they're our last number! And everybody fired at the car and we're all putting the gear on, all rushing down, down the steps. And we, um, we got <laughs> 10 minutes to do. And we just thought that was hysterically funny. <laughs> Carry on with the makeup and oh, um, Robin got some stage. He always borrowed him stage makeup. Always, can I just borrow your makeup? This is Joe Francis, isn't it? Yeah. So Robin said, "Look, I've, I've, I've got some stage makeup." Oh, thank you. There it is. What he'd done was he'd got some some shoe polish. <laughs> took some renovated polish. <laughs> took some renovated polish. He'd, he'd skimmed the top off and, and then put a very very thin layer of Max Factor on the top of it. He says, "Put plenty on." So I will, I will. And he, and he looked in the mirror and he looked like an Indian, a red Indian. And it wouldn't come off. So he had to go on and do his hat. The audience would in fits. They knew, they knew that he'd done something wrong. And we used to, we used to super glue, uh, he used to super glue his glass down so he couldn't pick his glass up. And we put explosives underneath things and what, under everything. Under oh, it was oh, brushes, everything exploded. And we had Terry Hall and Lenny Delighton. Oh. Lenny Delighton, lovely, lovely man. Teetotal, didn't drink. Oh. And we got him drunk on champagne. And he didn't drink. Oh. And he was. Oh. And he was from the old school. And he put his stage makeup on. He'd have the dots in the eyes and blue under there. And lipstick on. And he was real oh. stage makeup. It was well, this man, we got him legless. And I don't think I'd actually, but he was drunk and he was trying to put this and he's got lipstick over here and like this. And we said, Terry, you can't go on. I am no anger. <laughs> and we thought, this is a disaster. I mean, he can't keep his mouth still when he's got the, the mouth moved as much as that. <laughs> he didn't know what he to watch, you know, because he was the worst spent in the world. But a lovely man. And his act used to die every night because he was like, oh, Anyway, we thought, well, what's he going to be like? He's drunk. And he was <laughs> drunk as a skunk. So he, he decided he was going to go on the whole cast at the side of the show. And he went on the stage, this is going to be brilliant. And he was brilliant. His mouth didn't move at all. <laughs> we said, that's it, get pissed every night. <laughs> he was brilliant, wasn't he? Yeah. Back to Sir Francis. He came in uh, early on in the, in the show and he said, I found this fantastic butcher's just outside Scarborough. He says, oh, where to Whitby? He says, and he makes me pies. He says, and he makes me a lovely pie every week. Oh, it's lovely. Uh, he delivered it, didn't he? Oh, they delivered it and everything. He rings them up and we had the pie. He says, oh, it's lovely. And it was a really nice pork pie. So we rang him up and I said, uh, it's Graham from the Grummer Weeds. Will you please make him a special pie? <laughs> and just, just deliver it. But 
the one that you really make for him, keep it on one side and, and, and leave it at the box office. But we, we made this pie and they filled it full of sawdust. <laughs> Well, it looked exactly the same. It looked exactly the same, and they put some pebbles in it to make it feel heavy. <laughs> well, he says, right, lads, ready for pork pie? Yes, I And he put his knife into it, and the sawdust poured out. Well, I've never seen anybody look so disappointed in their life. <laughs> so why is your face on all the stamps? Well, if my ass was on it, they wouldn't lick it. <laughs> that is a good answer, that. <laughs> You know everything because you is the queen. Yes. Right. Check this out. Respect. Who said defeat is fine? Oh, um, Churchill? No. 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 Um, Henry VIII? No. I give in. It was Markeropodist. <laughs> but we did practical jokes on each other as well, not just other people. So Albert, did it to each other? Albert was a great brunt of art because Albert used to be the drummer. He's a uh, lovely man, Albert. Very simple man. I, I, don't, I mean that in the nicest possible way. I, I, I admire him in many respects and, and mm -hmm. quite jealous of him because nothing bothered him. He's such a simple man. We used to do things to him because we could. <laughs> 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 like we put ball bearings in his car, up caps, you know, so every time he drove, they rattled and he stopped and rolled stuff. And it drove him mad, you know. And then we'd take them out of one wheel and put them in the front wheel. And we'd say, oh, it's that, man. It's come back up great. And it really confused him. Right, I'll put exhaust whistle up as well. An <laughs> 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 exhaust whistle. It's a great thing. You can't buy them anymore. But we shoved it right up so you couldn't get it out with a, with a broom handle. And it sounds like a boiling kettle. So every time you rev it, it goes... <laughs> so the wheels are rattling. You know, so we're all car, you know. Right. But we did one job that actually backfired on us because as, when we actually parted company, um, from being five to three, he wanted to go his way and we wanted to do a three-handed thing. We, as a little parting gift, we got two kippers and we took off the air vent underneath the engine. That's where the heater air, air intake is. And we put these two kippers and put the air vent back, I just clips back on and just put these two kippers down and just left it. And about a week later, you can imagine what they smell like. So you've got a, a heater that's going and these kippers are really good. So he had it cleaned out, he had it valeted and we were still paying the bill for his car for the rest of that year, even though we'd split company. And he took it into Apple Yard and said, there's something wrong with this. Well, they stripped the dashboard down, they had the inside out. Yeah, oh, and he said, he said, that woman I take home, you know, I'll be on a night when we got that thing. I'm from Bingo, yeah, she said, I'm not taking it home, I'm sure she's pissed in my car. <laughs> But eventually they found the kick was it cost us nearly 700 pounds so I found it. I got the bill for 700 pounds if you'd have told me I don't know what they were to me once, I don't know why they pick on me. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, but he never twigged it. But it, no, he, he, was, he was a simple man, was Albert, and he did some daft things. He oh, did some really daft, things. wonderful yeah, tell us, things. Tell us, tell us, tell us. Well, if you're driving along with him uh, and there's a lay-by, he'll go in the lay-by and then back out again. Because <laughs> he thinks that's what the world does. <laughs> my heart's been in my mouth on umpteen occasions. <laughs> and uh, he drove from Leeds to Bournemouth in second gear. <laughs> Blow, blow the engine up, blow the engine up. We were working at a club in uh, Liverpool and we were in a, I'm trying to remember the name of the club, I can't remember it, was, I think it was a Shakespeare club in Liverpool. Anyway, they've got a great sense of humour in Liverpool. You go there regularly, don't you? Yeah, I go there three times a year to visit me up camp. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> they, they've got a fabulous sense of humour, so that, that, that means something in this one. Um, because we went to this sauna. And Albert came and he says, what are you doing like? Well, it's a sauna. What's the club? <laughs> well, you sit down and the heat makes your pores sweat and it cleans the muck out of your pores. You say no mucky? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you yeah, are. You don't have to come in if you don't want. <laughs> All right then. So he came in, took his towel off, took his underpants, his trunks off and sat on the coals. <laughs> So, the roadie then took him to the infirmary and he was in one of those black cabs. Stood up. Stood up. And the folding seat. He couldn't 
sit down because he left most of his backside on the collar. You know, <laughs> the so they treated him for third degree burns on his bum. And because they had to tell him, he said, well, uh, How did you do this then, uh, Mr. Sucker? <laughs> Sat on the coals. Oh, great! <laughs> they all went around the hospital. Sat on the coals here. And then all the people from the hospital, we'd given them tickets to come and see the show. We were there for the week. And they were all in the audience. How's your ass, Alby? <laughs> Your brother went, was it your brother? Your, oh, it was your my cousin. Cousin? Yeah, he worked in the Square Mile in London. And uh, of course they had a, a disaster at, at Lloyd's and he was an underwriter. So he had to, he had to, he had to do a runner. And he bought himself a bothy, a tiny little cottage. Uh, and it was 86 miles away from his nearest neighbour. And 186 miles away almost from the nearest village. And he sat there one night and it's pitch black. It's raining sideways, like it does up there. And there's a knock on his door. He thought, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> oh, words to that effect. <laughs> he opened the door and there's the biggest Scotsman you've ever seen stood there with the rain dripping off his eyebrows. He's got the knife down the sock. He's got the sporran and the kilt and the fluffy thing and the feather in the hat. He said, hello, oh, laddie. He said, hello. You're new to the Glen. He said, yes, yes I am. Oh, I said, well, to welcome you to the Glen, we're having a Cayley. So he says, thank you very much, what's a Cayley? He says, they'll be singing, they'll be dancing, they'll be drinking, and there'll be sex. He says, I'll go get changed. He says, no need to bother, laddie. They'll just be the two of them. <laughs> no, we did. Well, we, we went from uh, after that. We, we did the radio series. No, we did TV then, didn't we? Yep. We done we done some radio, and that transposed onto TV. And uh, some of the characters moved across there. From you did. Uh, where did you get? I'm just going to say, where, where did you get those characters? I mean, I always remember one that uh, was very very popular. Uncle Rubbish. Oh, we had Uncle Rubbish, <laughs> Ernest and Jeffrey, which were two camp. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, which were great fun because we had lived it most of the time, didn't we? It, our program was very, very politically incorrect, wasn't it? We, oh yeah. We used to do all sorts, and in those days it was it, no hard feelings, but nowadays it's not acceptable. But uh, Ernest and Jeffrey. Oh hello, it's Ernest and Jeffrey. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, we've been in our halls, haven't we? Yes, we have. Yes. We've been abroad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a car. It broke down, didn't it? Oh yes. That AA man come down. He says, "Crap in the carburetor." He says, how many times a day do we have to do that then? <laughs> oh, smack his legs in play time, oh, didn't really? <laughs> You don't know what you let yourself in. We went trolling, didn't we? Yes, we, we went trolling your beef first. Trolling in high bison. High bison, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we were suntanned all over except for our uh, twiddly bits. Our tails, yeah. Yes. <laughs> mm. So we thought it'd be a good idea if we got our tails sunburnt as well, so we didn't yeah. have any white bits. All over, all over town. Mm. But we mm. thought, didn't we? Mm. We did, we mm. did. Mm. 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 So we buried ourselves. <laughs> In the sand. In the sand. Except for our tails. We just left them out. <laughs> well, mine was just blowing in the breeze. <laughs> mine had one eye on a crab. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> and these two women from Preston came round. Do you remember that? <laughs> oh, oh. She says, here he is. She says, we got married for these. They're growing wild here. Yeah? <laughs> Still. We did. Until she said, there's one out with the bulbs on, I'm taking a cutting. <laughs> <laughs> so we used 
still have, we used to have fun with those two cards. We used to have like those a lot. <laughs> in fact, when we did it, we used to let the cameras roll, didn't they? We, oh, just, yeah. we used to carry on. We just messed up and just carry on. Half the stuff they put on the air, they couldn't use. We'd, I would love to get all of the outtakes. God, there were so many funny things. So, they, 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 what they sent you? They, they wouldn't put all of it on. Oh no, the the the. Well, I mean, even your uncle rubbish was sent it, wasn't it? Oh yeah, that. Well, it, the BBC. That's where we left the BBC, more or less, because one of the stories leaked out. Uh, I had to. Hello, kiddies. It was Uncle Rubbish used to talk. Gone. <laughs> Hello, kiddies. <laughs> Welcome to Uncle Rubbish's Toy Time Tea Time Time. <laughs> what shall we do today? I know, we'll open up Uncle Rubbish's special book of nature. The healthy young man. One day, a healthy young man was walking in the forest. And what do you think he nearly trod in? A pond. <laughs> there was something floating in that pond as well. A lily pad. And on the lily pad was a little frog. And the little frog said to the healthy young man, if you take me home with you and put me on your pillow tonight and just before you go to sleep, if you give me a kiss, I will turn into a handsome prince. So the healthy young man took the frog home with him. He put him on his pillow. And that night, just before he went to sleep, he kissed the little frog. And sure enough, the next morning when he woke up, there laid next to him was a strapping young lad of 16 with long flowing locks and nothing on but a smile. <laughs> and that, Your Honour, is the case for the defence. <laughs> That's why we're up the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> it's daft, isn't it? I will, I'm painting my house at the moment, and I'm up a ladder this afternoon, and a chap walks down with a lovely overcoat on and a briefcase. So I came down the ladder, I said, hello. He said, uh, oh, hello, uh, Jehovah's Witness. Oh, I said, really? Come in. I said, the kettle's just been boiled. I said, my wife's made some scones. Come in the lounge, sit down, we'll have a cup of tea. How many sugars? Two, right, okay. So we sat down. I said, right, what's it all about then? He said, I've no idea, I've never got this far before. <laughs> 